So verse number one says, Now in the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put in execution, in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them. This was the day that Haman the Agagite had, uh, had uh, conspired against the Jews and against Mordecai and said, we're going to destroy them on this day. Uh, it, but it turned out to be not the day of their destruction, but the day of their deliverance. Though it was turned to the contrary, that the Jews had rule over them that hated them. And that's the God that we serve. We serve the God that with men these things are impossible, but with our God all things are possible. And so what should have been the day of de defeat became the day of victory. And it says, The Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus to lay hand on such as sought their hurt, and no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon all people. No weapon that's formed against you, church, shall, shall prosper. And all the rulers of the provinces and the lieutenants and the deputies and the officers of the king helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. And we saw last week that the principalities and the powers being made subject to the Lord Jesus Christ, that this process is going on now, that all enemies are, are ultimately... He's placed in his foot upon those, and the last enemy we saw that will be destroyed is death. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame went out through, uh, throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai waxed greater and greater. Thus the Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of the sword, and slaughter, and destruction, and did what they would unto those that hated them. So that gets us up to where we were last week. And then in verse number 6 we read, And in Shushan, the palace, the Jews slew and destroyed 500 men. And I thought as I read that, I thought there were plenty of enemies. There were 500 that they slew right here in the city of the king. Right right here uh, in the palace. Right here where it should have been the place uh, uh, where there was truth and where there was justice. There were plenty of enemies among them there. And I thought, that shouldn't surprise us. Right? Don't we know that what the enemy has done? He's sown tares among the wheat. Right? Uh, but what we know, just as we see here, is they, they will be purged one day, right? They may grow and they may prosper right now because of the benefits that's intended for the good of the church. But they're not members of the body. They're just parasites that have attached themselves to the body. And one day those parasites will be cleaned off. One day uh, that which was intended for the wheat will be solely for the benefit of the wheat, and God will see to it that not a single one of the tares are gathered into His barn. I couldn't help but think as I read about these 500 men here that we saw at the end of chapter number 9 that the fear of the Jews came upon many, and it said many of the people of the land became Jews. There was opportunity, just like we saw with Haman. Right? There was opportunity to say, let's abandon this foolish effort of standing against the Jews and let's join with them. Let's become Jews ourselves. And we saw that as a type of those that are saved as the gospel goes forth, as that decree of the gospel of Jesus Christ goes forth. But for those that refuse, for those that rebelled and refused to submit to Mordecai, this type of the Lord Jesus Christ, their destruction does eventually come. You're experiencing God's mercy if you're living and breathing right now. That's not your air that you're breathing. That belongs to God. And the only reason that that air benefits you and that your lungs work and that the blood flows through your body is because God sustains you. You're not making it in your own strength. That's the foolish thought that man has that I'm just, I'm so strong and I'm so able and I can do it. You know, that, isn't that what we, that's what we, they pump into the minds of our children today through uh, all these various forms of entertainment that if enough of us join together, we can do it. Well, that's what they thought at Babel. Right? If we get enough of us together, nobody can withstand us. Let's get a bunch of us together and make a name for ourselves. And God showed them what you can accomplish without Him. Nothing. And you're not making it in your own strength right now. If you're outside of Jesus Christ, you don't realize that you have strength because God's given you strength. And you need Him to continue. And you need Him for eternal life. And at any moment, the soul can be outside of the mercy of God and there's no more opportunity. Seek the Lord while He may be found, sinner. 
Call upon him while he is near. The opportunity to call to become a Jew was at the end of chapter number 8, but now the time has passed and 500 are destroyed in the city in Shushan in the palace. They are slaughtered. The day of their destruction had come. The day, the time for God's mercy had run out. And in verse number 7, we begin to see some specific individuals that were destroyed, that judgment was uh, enacted upon. And these, we're going to find out, are the sons of the enemy. They are the sons of the wicked one. That wicked Haman, that's what it called him in this scripture. That wicked Haman, the enemy of the Jews, we've seen him as a type of our great adversary, the devil, right? As a type of Satan. And it's interesting to me with all the characters that we have in Scripture and all the different times that we don't we never find out what people's names are, that God makes it a point here to specifically give us the ten names of Haman's son. Five hundred were just killed in the previous verse, and we don't know any of them. But for these ten, God makes sure that he records their names. And I found that very interesting, and I thought I better not pass over that. Better take some time and look into that. Why are these names given? We don't often have such detail, so it must be important if God determined to include it in His Word. When I went to Strong's, I couldn't find the meaning of these words because um, they, uh, with the exception of one, it says they are all of Persian derivation. So I had to go to a different dictionary to find out the meanings. And so I wanted to just go through that briefly, the meanings of these names. I can only assume that these are the names in order of birth, that we're probably starting with the firstborn and going down to that which is last. In either case, this is the order that God determined to put it in His Word. And as I've looked at these, what I've come to see, view these meanings as, I've come to view these as the birth of sin in the heart of our adversary of Satan as that angel fell and rebelled against God. These are the sons of the enemy here. And the first one that's listed is Parshandatha. Parshandatha, this name means given by prayer. Given by, isn't that, that's what I thought too, Brother Kenny. Huh, that's interesting. Given by, it's interesting, especially in light of the way the rest of the names work out. But it would seem, whenever a person prays, what is that person acknowledging? They're acknowledging that I don't have the ability of myself, right? They're acknowledging that I need help. Prayer is a crying out to God, right? It is a communication with God. I'm making my petitions known to Him because I don't have the ability without you, God. And so prayer confesses my inability and it confesses my need. And the first child does that, given by prayer. There is a confession of dependency outside of oneself. But then the next name, Dalphon, and this is the only one that has a Hebrew origin, which is also interesting. Since we're in a foreign land here and Haman is clearly not a Hebrew, but this one actually is traced back to a Hebrew word, and I'll show you the Hebrew word. Hold your place in Job 16 and verse number 20. Job 16. I was going the wrong way. It's after Esther. Esther's in such an odd spot. Brother Al was asking me, I think it was last week, about the timeline of Esther, and I hadn't looked specific. I kind of had it in my mind when I thought Esther took place, but... It's estimated that Esther's taking place sometime within uh, Ezra's writing. So the span of Ezra is a very long period of time. Ezra would have been, uh, Esther would have been sometimes toward the end of the book of Ezra, and Nehemiah would have come after that. So if you just kind of want to place it in your mind, that's what they believe to be the case. We don't... Uh, all we know here is King Ahasuerus, and there's even some debate about which Persian king that was. So... Uh, so I've tried to not get too deep into that and just kind of consider this as it's presented to us in the Word of God. But in Job 16 and verse number 20, we're going to find the root word for this word Dalphon. Dalphon, the, the actual word is only used this one time in Esther. But here's the root word. And in Job 16 and in verse number 20, My friends scorn me, but mine eye poureth out 
tears unto God. Tears is added by the translators, but that's the implication here. What's he pouring out? He's pouring out his tears before God. And so the word Dalphon, the name of that son, means dripping. And, and it says by implication it means to weep. As you have like the dripping of the tears, like the pouring out of the tears unto God here in Job uh, chapter number 16. And so uh, I'll, I'll tell you as we get into this, I wasn't sure exactly what to do with that. When you see this first name says means giving by prayer, but then you have this word that, that has to do with weeping and has to do with mourning. And I wondered, perhaps this is an indication of the way of Satan's view and the way Satan felt when he realized that God's going to exalt man over the angelic race. God's going to make man in His image. This glorious being that I am, God would have me serve them. And I say that because of the next name that comes. The next name is Aspatha. And this is the first name that we have very clearly an indication of something's gone wrong. The name Aspatha, and I should go over there to where it actually is and make sure I'm pronouncing that right. Aspatha is the way it says it's supposed to be pronounced. Aspatha means the enticed gather. The enticed gather. Now, look at Proverbs 1.10 so that we'll understand something about this word ent to entice. It never carries with it a good connotation. When you speak of enticing, it's not a good thing. It's, it's, it's something that's typically associated with trying to draw someone into sin. It's, it's associated with temptation. And that's what we see here in Proverbs 1 and in verse number uh, 10. My son, if sinners what? Entice. entice thee. If they tempt you, if they desire to draw you into their sin and to draw you into their wicked way of life, consent thou not. This third son is named the enticed gather. And so it carries with it that sinister meaning, that, uh, that, 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 uh, that temptation to go into sin. And, and from here, there seem, from this point on, the naming of the children, there seems to be a pride and a self-reliance that's declared in the names that are chosen. As if at this point, Satan says, I'm not going to serve them. I'll show God who I am. How dare he, someone as glorious as me, serve them? No way. The next one of the names, Poretha, means fruitfulness or frustration. It was the only word that I looked up that uh, there were two meanings that seemed to be uh, in contradiction of one another. Fruitfulness or frustration. And I thought, you know, that's how, exactly how it is in the heart of the sinner. There's a constant... The, 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 the wicked are as the troubled sea, right? There's that constant churning up and that, that, that disturbance and that struggle and that turmoil. There is no rest for the wicked. There's not any peace. I remember being outside of Jesus Christ and I remember the weight of the guilt of my sin and I didn't recognize it as that, but I was trying to constantly put that out of my head. One of the things that we've seen here recently that the Spirit of God does in the world is it brings conviction of sin. He brings conviction of sin, I should say. And man's trying, constantly trying to drown that out, right? Constantly trying to drown out that voice of his conscience that God has placed in there. And we don't want to hear about it and we don't want to think about it. And, and, and I think that's why it's so popular today for kids to stick those earbuds in their ears or slap those headphones on because I don't want to think about anything else. I just want to be drawn into this world that makes me oblivious to anything that matters. I don't want to think about weighty things and important things. But fruitfulness and frustration. Satan began to look at himself, his own glory, his own fruitfulness, and frustrated with the fact that he wasn't exalted anymore. Why should one so glorious as he is serve man? And you know, I understand. You can take this with a grain of salt. I'm just telling you. Ten names are listed here for us. God decided to put these ten names in here, and I believe I would be doing you a disservice to not look them up and tell you what they mean. 
Ten sons of the enemy. Ten sons of the wicked one. Fruitfulness. Look at how fruitful, how glorious that I am and the frustration with the fact that God says that these angelic race in, in the beginning of Hebrews there is ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those that are heirs of salvation. He wouldn't have that. You know what you see in Scripture every time you see a man see an angel? Fear and trembling, right? They fall down on their face. They, act, they think they're dead, right? This is, this is the end. This is how it ends right here. Because the angels are so glorious in appearance. Even when they seem to veil that glory to an extent that they fit in more, like when the two men came to Sodom, it's clear there's a difference between them and everybody else. And yet these glorious beings, God would have them serve those men that are heirs of salvation. The next name in Esther is the name Adaliah. Adaliah. And this is interesting as well. It says, I shall be drawn up of Yah. You guys familiar with the Hebrew name of God, Yahweh? This is the shortened, the abbreviated form. You find this in the Psalms, that that name is used sometimes, Yah. I shall be drawn up. I shall be exalted. There's a desire here for self-exaltation in this name. And then the next one in Par, Parmashta. The name Parmashta. I'm sorry, I missed one, didn't I? Uh, Eridatha. Eridatha means the lion of the decree. So this is now a name that's chosen to represent Haman and that which he is. Uh, this is a, now a name that Satan would associate with himself. But we know who the true line is, right? The line of the tribe of Judah, the one that is deserving to be exalted over all is the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, isn't Satan referred to as a lion? A roaring lion that walks about seeking whom he may devour? He takes this name unto himself, and it's, this name means the lion of the decree. Satan would have himself to be known by the mighty lion. Parmashta, the next name, means superior. You see, it, this, the pride continues to come out as these names. We're gone. Gone is the dependence by prayer, you know. I get this one. It just continually gets worse and worse as you see exaltation and pride in the name. Superior, how Satan views himself in pride. The next name is Arasai. And this means lion of my banners. Brother Gene talked about banners whenever we read the Song of Solomon. Remember that? And remember what those banners were? Those were the flags. Those were the emblems of the, of the various armies as they went forth. It was to display who they were and to display their strength. And it's not line of His banners. The name means line of My banners. I want to declare My greatness and My glory, Satan said. His heart was lifted up in pride. And then the next name, uh, Eridai. Eridai means the lion is enough. Three times he associates himself with this term lion. Three times he takes that name unto himself, the name which points us to Jesus Christ. I will not have this man to reign over me. And then finally, last of all, Vajaz Atha. And this name means strong as the wind. And what is it that in John 3 Jesus compares to the wind as he says it blows wherever it wills and you know we we see the effect and, and you know hear the sound but it's the spirit of God, right? And so Satan declares himself, I'm I'm he proudly declares I'm just as strong strong as the wind. You can take that or leave it, all right? I just thought the names were interesting and the way that they progressed on from a place of dependency to start with till just one name after the other that represents pride and loftiness, which is what Satan's sin was. All what we do know is that all ten of these sons, they were testimonies to Haman's strength. And I'll show you that in Esther chapter 5. This was, these men were testimonies to Haman's strength and his greatness. And you remember we, as we were in Esther 5, when he comes back 
And, you know, he's been exalted and he's been asked to this banquet with the queen. And, you know, he just can't believe that he's been singled out like that. And, and, uh, but, but with all of that, he's still bitter over the fact that Mordecai the Jew won't bow to him. And in Esther 5 and verse number 11, as, re, as he's relaying how great he is, Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his what? Children. Children. These ten sons represent his strength. These ten sons represent his glory and his greatness and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. These ten sons were bragging points for the king. I mean, for Haman. You've met people like that, right? If you met my boy, you know, it's like, uh, he's just the best that there is, you know. There's only one father that can say that in all honesty, right? Amen. There is only one son that is the best that there is. And that is the only begotten son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. The rest of us are all in the same boat, guilty sinners in need of a Savior. But ten sons that are testimonies to Haman's strength and now his greatness. And guess what? What does Esther 9 and verse number 10 say? Why did we read those ten sons? The ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, slew they. All ten of them did. All those things that represented his strength and his glory, all dead. But on the spoil, they laid not their hand. And we're going to look at that, Lord willing, next week. All ten of those men dead. Look at Isaiah chapter number 14. Isaiah chapter number 14. Here we have another that represents Satan. And what do we find to be the case? What does God say as He reveals the heart of this fallen angel? What took him down? Verse 11, Thy pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of the vials. The worm is spread under thee and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? All ten sons, all of that which represented his strength, were killed in a moment. For thou hast said in thine heart, and here's that pride that you saw coming out as Haman named his kids, I will ascend into heaven. I'm going to pick names that refer to myself as the lion. I'm going to take that name upon. I'm going to say I'm as strong as the wind. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be the greatest of the angelic race. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And that was the place reserved for Jesus Christ. I'll take the name lion unto myself. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. And yet it shall be so for you as it is for all that rebel against the Most High God. Listen, sinner. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The Apostle Paul used that phrase when he was talking about an ambassador. He was talking about the fact that we are made ambassadors for Christ. And I've been sent here today to beseech you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. This is your opportunity now. You, you, you're foolish to think you have another moment. That's why we persuade men. That's why there's such a sense of urgency. Because we understand the terror of the Lord. Be reconciled to God. God in mercy sends His ministers to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ so that you might understand there is a way of salvation. There is a way of escape. That hard way that you're in, then the way of a transgressor is hard. They can pretty it up and they can make it look great on the front of the magazine covers, but you know what? For every magazine cover that looks like that, there's another one that says, Divorce. Didn't work out. It wasn't as glorious as we thought. This is what was really going on behind the scenes. We see how it really is. 
And if we run after what this world has to offer, we will end broken, we will end disappointed, we will end in destruction. But in Jesus Christ, there is a way of salvation. It is the only way of salvation. And there is righteousness, and there is holiness, and there is peace in Jesus Christ. So much so, He does such a good job with sinners that Jude says they will stand faultless in the presence of His glory. Hallelujah. But for Satan, for those that trust in their own strength, it ends like this. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man who made the earth to tremble and did shake the kingdoms? Where's all that glory and that greatness now? Jesus Christ is the only hope that we have. Every one of us sitting here. The only hope you have is outside of yourself. It is in Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Men and brethren, what shall we do? They asked Peter on the day of Pentecost. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Amen.